Hi, it's Christina with the Sisyphean Journal, and I'm responding to a video from The View that Matt Walsh was critiquing. So this is a reaction to a reaction. And Anne Hathaway was on The View um, commemorating the 16th anniversary of The Devil Wears Prada. And Joy Behar read Hathaway's Instagram post about what a wonderful thing abortion is for young women because it furthers their careers and honors their reproductive destiny. And Behar asked Hathaway while she wrote the post, why she wrote the post, because we're in the fight. We're in the fight every day, every minute. And you mentioned the devil wears Prada turning sweet 16. Some 16 year old's life has been irrevocably changed because of the current overturning of Roe v. Wade. Ms. Hathaway, with all due respect, I would like to share with you the 16 year olds that I think about all the time and that I'm fighting for every day. Barbara Hoppert was a 16 year old high school sophomore when she checked into Loma Linda University Hospital for a second trimester abortion on the recommendation of her doctor. She had a congenital heart problem. The abortion was performed February 22nd in 1983 and during the procedure, Barbara's heart stopped. They were unable to revive her and she was pronounced dead on the operating table. Christella Forte, age 16, screamed, convulsed, and went into cardiac arrest on January 14, 1986, 27 hours after her uterus was filled with a strong salt solution for an abortion at New Center Hospital. She died without ever expelling the 23-week fetus. The salt solution that was supposed to just kill the baby had accidentally been injected into her um, bloodstream, poisoning her and causing cardiac arrest. And what's particularly disgusting about Christella's death and some of the other deaths is that the saline installation technique had been discredited. Japan, the Soviet Union, and Sweden had already completely abandoned it by the 1960s because it was so risky to women. But these doctors just charged ahead. 16-year-old Erica K. Richardson was brought to Dr. Jean Crawford by her aunt on March 1st, 1989 for an abortion being performed without her mother's knowledge. Erica's aunt had taken her to Crawford because Washington Center Hospital had said that Erica's pregnancy was too far advanced for a safe abortion. Erica's aunt reported that Crawford left Erica unattended and bleeding for four hours after her abortion, then at 11 p.m. carried her out to the car and told her aunt to take her home and put her to bed. Erica's aunt was a nurse. She knew that something was wrong. So instead, she took her niece to a hospital where she was already in respiratory arrest by the time they got there. Erica died of an embolism shortly after midnight on March 2nd. Her uterus and cervix had been punctured during the 19-week abortion. A 16-year-old girl identified in medical board documents only as FS underwent a safe, legal, second trimester saline abortion. Saline! in a California hospital on August 29th of 1969. She had developed an infection after the abortion. She was treated, transferred to another hospital. The infection um, settled in her heart. The doctors performed two heart valve transplants uh, replacements and they'd scheduled yet another one, but she died on March 6th. Katrina Poole was conflicted about her pregnancy. She actually wanted her baby, but at 16, she thought about how well she was doing in school. So after a lot of thought, it took her a long time to make up her mind. She decided on abortion. So her doctor referred her to a woman's choice in Jacksonville, Florida. Clinic records show no evidence that anybody did a proper assessment of what kind of care Katrina needed. There was no ultrasound performed. There was no documented physical examination. Dr. Herman Miller just charged ahead with a routine suction abortion suitable only for first trimester abortions of 12 weeks or fewer. During the abortion, the doctor noted that he'd suctioned out far more placental material than he expected. So instead of ordering an ultrasound, actually finding out how big the baby was and reassessing his approach, he just kept chugging ahead. And in the end, he estimated she'd actually been 22 weeks pregnant, not fewer than 12 weeks pregnant. That evening, Katrina took her prescribed medication, kissed her mother goodnight, and went to bed. The next morning, her family found her dead. 
Loretta Morton was 16 years old when she underwent a legal abortion in December of 1983. On January 3rd of 1984, she was at home and started having trouble breathing. Her mother called an ambulance and the crew rushed her to a hospital, but the resuscitation attempts were in vain. Within an hour of losing consciousness, Loretta was dead. The autopsy showed that she died from a pulmonary embolism from the abortion. 16-year-old Maureen Espinoza underwent a safe legal abortion at a doctor's office in San Antonio on March 28th of 1997. During the abortion, the doctor punctured Maureen's uterus but didn't note this in her medical records or saying anything to her, which indicates he might not have even noticed. He sent Maureen home. On April 3rd, she went to the emergency room and over the ensuing days, doctors performed two surgeries to try to save her life to no avail. She died April 15th, 1997. The next young woman, um, her death is just from medical, um, medical journal articles. So we gave her the pseudonym Nancy Rowe at Life Dynamics. Nancy was 16 years old and 16 weeks pregnant when she underwent a legal saline abortion. Here we go, these saline abortions again in 1972. She developed an amniotic fluid embolism that led to clotting problems, which led to her death. 16-year-old Natalie Myers was brought to San Vicente Hospital in Los Angeles by her mother for a safe and legal abortion on October 21st, 1972. Dr. Milton Gottlieb injected saline, good old saline, into her uterus that day. The next day, Natalie expelled the dead baby but retained the placenta. She started having trouble breathing and suffering abdominal pain, so they transferred her to a fully equipped hospital rather than the abortion hospital that she had been in. Natalie was in shock when she arrived. They performed a DNC, but she still had severe infection in her uterus. So on October 26, they performed a hysterectomy, but to no avail. Natalie was pronounced dead at 9.35 a.m. on October 27th. Now, the National Abortion Federation is an organization of abortion practitioners and their for-profit and non-profit facilities. They are considered highly reputable, despite the fact that Kermit Gosnell moonlighted at one of them. 16-year-old Patricia Chacon lost her life after placing her trust in one of these clinics. She had no way of knowing as she climbed on the, uh, the abortion table at Avalon Hospital that 24-year-old Denise Holmes had died at Avalon in December of 1970. And she had no way of knowing that she was going to become the second of at least 18 women who died after a safe legal abortion at one of Edward Campbell Allred's facilities. She was 24 weeks pregnant and the abortion for some reason took five hours to complete. Patricia retained fetal tissue, so she was scheduled for a second procedure that afternoon to complete the abortion and there are conflicting stories of what happened next. Fast Eddie Allward pronounced Patricia dead at 4.30 p.m., saying that she died of an embolism during the second surgery, but Patricia's parents said that their child bled to death while left unattended. The next death is another one we know only through medical board documents. Patricia Rowe was 16 years old and five weeks pregnant when she went to a doctor's office for an abortion sometime around 1975. And for some reason, the doctor chose another antiquated technique, not saline, but a different one, it had been common in criminal abortions. He inserted a catheter into Patricia's uterus and left it in overnight. The next day, he removed the catheter and performed a DNC to complete the abortion. Two days later, she arrived in the emergency room reporting fever and severe abdominal pain, and she told the ER physicians about the abortion. She was diagnosed with sepsis and given antibiotics and told to return to her doctor for follow-up. Several hours after leaving the emergency room, she returned because she felt even worse, so they admitted her to the hospital and administered more antibiotics. The doctor who did the abortion came to the hospital and examined her, attributed the symptoms to a reaction to the antibiotic, and had the medication discontinued. Less than five hours after she was admitted, the staff found her with no blood pressure and they weren't able to revive her. She died of sepsis from an incomplete abortion. On March 4th of 1975, Dr. Robert Julius Sherman performed a purportedly safe legal abortion on 16-year-old Rita McDowell, who was in the second trimester of her pregnancy. He performed a vacuum aspiration abortion typically used for first trimester abortions using a seven millimeter cannula way too small for the parts of a 12-week fetus to pass through. So 
it was a given that he was going to leave parts of the fetus, if not the entire fetus, still in her uterus. When Sherman discharged Rita, he told her mother she would probably expel the fetus that night. And as they left the office, Rita told her mother, Oh, mama, mama, I feel like I had 100 needles in me. Rita didn't expel the fetus and said she developed a high fever. Her mother called Sherman's office on March 5th to seek care, and she said that Sherman would not speak to her, and the receptionist said to bring Rita in in two days. But in the early morning hours of March 7th, Rita awoke screaming, then collapsed in her mother's arms. Doctors at the hospital where she was taken removed a macerated fetus, but she died from massive infection just after midnight on March 8th. An investigation into Rita's death revealed evidence that Sherman deliberately performed incomplete abortions so he could charge an additional $150 for follow-up care. So I cannot for the life of me understand why the self-appointed champions of women living the lives they want to lead seem to have zero problem with women and young girls like these 16-year-olds being unable to live any kind of life at all. Ms. Hathaway, would you explain this to me?